Hello, everyone, and welcome to our LinkedIn Live brought to you by SAP, the market leader in enterprise application software. My name is Sarah Barnes Humphrey. I'm the founder and host of Let's Talk Supply Chain and Blended, and I'm joined today by David Vallejo, VP and Global Head of Supply Chain Planning, Manufacturing, and Logistics at SAP for our session today. Welcome, David. Thanks so much for joining me. Thanks so much for having me. Sarah. So, so um, today we are, of course, talking about building risk resilient and sustainable supply chains. And this has really become the most important conversation for 2023. I mean, the last few years have shown us that when it comes to supply chains, risk can show itself in a multitude of different ways, right? Across every single link in the chain. So the need to create supply chain resiliency and manage global supply risk has really become abundantly clear. But building a resilient supply chain is not an easy or overnight process, particularly in the highly complex and connected globalized environment that we find ourselves in. And when you layer ambitious ESG goals and sustainability targets, it's over the top. So what can we as leaders do? How do we pick apart the complexities? How do we approach the ever-evolving challenges we're facing? And what can we do now to lay the right foundations for the future? Well, those are some really big questions. And David and I are going to do our best to tackle them today and give you the insight and inspiration you need to foster sustainable and future-proof supply chains in your own organizations. Now, we are going to be taking questions throughout this conversation. So make sure that you put your questions in the comments from wherever you're watching. And we are going to get to those questions because we definitely want to hear from you. David's got some amazing stories and analogies, and I can't wait for you to hear them. So let's set the scene. We're, we're all talking about resilience because we're all being cons constantly battered by disruptions. But what does resilience actually mean for supply chain? What does it mean for organizations? David. Yeah, so I'm super passionate about supply chain, you know, spending the majority of my career in this field. And the first thing that I'm thinking about when it comes to resiliency is that we're in supply chain, we're heroes. Uh, we yep. are like the best firefighters in the world. And that thought actually is probably problematic we, because if you think about uh, and when I think about my, how I started my career, it was actually in customer service, troubleshooting, uh, you know, supply chain systems. And, and, and this was, we were really nerdy and really putting, you know, every effort in day and night on the weekend to make sure that things kept running and we felt really good about it. Uh, but sometimes it was, you know, even the best firefighter couldn't really prevent like a system going down, a major right. shortage causing uh, a factory to send 2000 people home. Right. And and I think there's a lot to learn from firefighting. Right. So uh, you will just hear me bringing up analogies. Right. But uh, looking back at, you know, fire was actually a big danger. Um, mm. If you think about the great fire of Rome or, you know, Paris, London, and the London fire was like 1600, was actually interesting um, because the kind of colloquial fire brigades, there were people going around the city with like rattles. They were called the rattle watch, right? Really? And yeah. I have no idea. See, and, this is going to be a history lesson, everybody, too. It's be I love it. And, um, and so the, the, it was really after that great fire that caused huge harm, a lot of dead people, um, where there was the first organized thought, how can we prevent fires in the future? And you know how that, who started that? Nope. It was the insurance companies. <laughs> oh, really? So, yes. And, and they thought like, we have to be more uh, thoughtful about this. And technology obviously comes into play too, right? This is where they had the first thought about, you know, better ladders and, and fire hoses. Mm -hmm. And I mean, you, you remember from, like from comic movies where they had the chain with buckets, right? Mm -hmm. and, and just spraying the house, that wasn't really working. And the other thing was regulations. Um, you had like still wooden chimneys, 
-hmm. And they said, well, that's not allowed anymore, right? And you need to have spacing between houses. And and um, I think there is a lot to learn that firefighting is not just responding, but it's actually creating uh, an infrastructure that is more preventative. And uh, so it's not just about, you know, smoke detectors and, and then being able to have the best fire truck in the world. It's actually preventing uh, fires. And I think we've come a long way so that fires today, I mean, we still have wildfires. I'm here in California, right? Um, but the technology has prevented uh, fires actually from becoming a major, uh, a major issue. So well, was, and, and I also think the process has a big part in that as well, especially if you're using the firefighting analogy, right? It's the mm -hmm. process that's going to be life-saving for anybody that they're going into a fire for or for themselves specifically as well. So it's not just the prevention. It's also the process that also makes them resilient and able to do their job. Exactly. Like a following a protocol, right? If, if there is a, a fire happening, then here is the process that you follow. And that mm -hmm. process was already pre-arranged. Um, and uh, so, so I think that analogy holds true for supply chain resiliency, right? You have to be better prepared. It's not just responding, better prepared. You have, uh, you understand the vulnerabilities in your mm -hmm. supply chain. Uh, you understand wh where are the potential weak spots that you could improve, right? right? Sort of similar to like preventing having really inflammable material uh, in, in your house, right? So I think that analogy for me, that means resiliency and there's a lot that we can talk about what become the ingredients to have a more risk resilient supply chain well and i think that's what we're going to talk about today but before we do that let's sort of itemize and talk about what the risks and disruptions are that are continuing to rock supply chain i mean seriously we've always had disruption we've had some major major disruption over the last couple of years and i think that's going to be something that's going to stick with supply chain over the next few years. And so we really need to figure out what that means for us in our organizations and what that looks like. But let's talk about what disruption has looked like, what it's looked like over the last couple of years for us, and what do we continue to see? Yeah, so it's interesting. If, if I, I looked at a study, I think it was by the National Reserve, they created sort of the supply chain volatility index over like the last decades. Oh, right? give us the info. And uh and, and then you have like the, the peak spot. So volatility is like, you know, all of a sudden you have something unpredictable entering your supply chain, causing a disruption. It could be cost, availability, natural disaster, whatever, right? And, um, and so you had, you see that disasters or disruptions were always there. You had like these big mm -hmm. flares, like 9-11, the Fukushima, Thailand flooding. Frozen. Uh, Can you let everybody else in on the frozen <laughs> disruption? That you really make... Make me tell that story. Yes, that, that, I love yeah, it. twenty fourteen, right? Uh, one, uh, and uh, we were, you know, parents of kids, and uh, that was a major supply chain disruption because what happened twenty fourteen? Frozen came out, you know, <laughs> and became a very popular uh, Disney movie, and everybody loved Elsa, and everybody loved Olaf, and it became so successful that the other piece of a successful movie is merchandise and they didn't have enough merchandise actually prepared for the global demand and your parents got really really angry and formed like groups on facebook and whatsapp and ganged up and said we you know where's my elsa that i can put under the christmas tree so right so it has always been there that supply chains are not stable at at, at, at any point of time you have to be uh, effectively prepared. And sometimes it's high stress on the business and low stress on supply chain, like the financial crisis in 2008. Well, the demand was all of a sudden going away. So people were standing in a warehouse, right. you know, twiddling their thumbs and were like, I have nothing to do. Um, but I think we can learn from the past to sort of categorize the disruptions, right? Um, like, so one example is just natural you know disasters we talked mm -hmm. you know floodings and there was one in uh, actually that, that actually brought down a whole you know 
uh, infected, uh, impacted a lot of industries was um, a, uh, a natural disaster in, in, in Madagascar where there was like a, some storm and rain and Madagascar is actually providing 80% of all the natural vanilla in the world. Oh, wow. So not a lot of people know that, right? Had no idea. Uh, and so I think that was uh, 2017. And all of a sudden, the cost of natural vanilla shot up from like $100 per kilo to $500 per kilo, right? And so there, there is something to learn there in that resiliency was coming in on two fronts. One, businesses for like bakery products and ice cream and beverages, you, you don't even imagine where vanilla is all going into. Shampoo had to be, first of all, aware that this was happening. Right. So the ones, the companies that were aware earlier were able to actually stockpile and buy a lot more inventory still at the cheap price. And the second resiliency was being able to pivot your product design to, for example, switch to more artificial vanilla, right? Um, so there, there's something to be learned from that. So I think the disruptions we will see in the future can be categorized nature. Uh, you know, you, you see a higher density of natural disasters, uh, and, you know, there is an aspect of long-term climate change. Here in California, we have also short-term swings with El Nino and El Nina, where you have extreme drought, and then now we're now having Right, we were just talking flooding, about that. Right? Yeah. Um, so that you need to be prepared for, and that can actually cause havoc uh, in your supply chain, right? If you mm -hmm. have manufacturing capacity in the world where there it's in the path of a hurricane, then right. you know that there is going to be risk. Yep. And I think the second top of mind for a lot is um, geopolitical, you know, trade tensions. Uh, we still have the war going on that causes a lot of tension uh, around the globe. Uh, you know, relationship with China, um, relationship with Taiwan, where there's, uh, of course, a big, uh, capacity for for semiconductor chips that go into everything that we know today um, so that's i think sort of the second dimension and the third dimension is cost we're living in an environment of 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 inflation and a lot yep. think about the consumer price index but there's also the ppi the producer price index right that causes essentially a compression on on margins for companies because they have to now buy things that are more costly and then also the the interest rates, right? Uh, if interest rates are going up, your cost of capital becomes higher. Mm -hmm. That means storing inventory will be more expensive. So it right. perhaps changes your inventory strategy as well. So mm -hmm. that's sort of undercurrent disruptions that we hope all we can continue to control. But I think these are top of mind for companies, you know, coming sort of out of the post-pandemic easing of some of the major disruptions we had in shortages and 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 shortages of also transportation capacity etc um but these were like the future risks uh others are cyber security risk uh regulatory Ooh. changes yep. um that will be for some companies are sort of not so top of mind until they're until they happen by it yep. yeah yeah and uh, my, my sister was just telling me she's a teacher and uh, that like her school district was brought down by some probably kids that went into the computer system and, and right. hijacked it and asked for ransomware. Okay, wow. that's a school. But what happens if that's your supply chain, your supplier, yeah. right? Your supplier, uh, even one aspect of the supply chain, I mean, could be disastrous, right? Exactly. I just want to let Rob know that we see your question. We're going to get to your question later on in the show. And I want to give a shout out to Ankit, Christian, Brian, and Chris over on my personal LinkedIn who are joining us today. Now, we've talked about the risks and the disruptions, but what are the opportunities? And actually, I want to let the audience know if you are experiencing any disruptions that we haven't mentioned just now in the discussion, put it in the comments. 
we can talk about those because I want to see if they're aligning with what we're talking about today. But David, what are the opportunities, right? There's a, we always talk about the risk and the disruption and, you know, the, the things that are kind of happening, but there's always opportunity when it comes to disruption and risk. What are the opportunities that we're seeing for businesses and supply chains? So, so one, the opportunity, if you've articulated positively, if you're better prepared to deal with the disruptions, you're going to be faring better than your competition. Okay. Competitive so you, advantage. I mean, we've been talking about using supply chains as competitive advantage exactly. for a really long time. Now we can really do it, right? Yeah. So it's, it's not just, you know, preventing your, your business from, you know, going, taking the nosedive. And, and of course you have any disruption uh, can have such a massive impact that it wipes out the profit of an entire year. Okay. Right. And uh, that it, it, it wipes out essentially uh, uh, your, your business continuity that is really endangered. Right. So I think there is an awareness that now, we have created, which is the opportunity, that supply chains are key for businesses, are absolutely key for businesses. They're not anymore this sort of afterthought. Um, it's just a cost center. In fact, in supply chain, you could argue you can only fail because you, it's all just moving the product on time. So there's never going to be a win. You can only fail, right? Uh, now it's, I think, regarded uh, as really an important aspect of the DNA of your company, how you run your company, how important you see that topic all the way from the board and C-suite down uh, to your operation. So I think that is the opportunity. The other opportunity is, and that goes into the direction of competitive advantage, is customer service. I mean, I, I remember I we bought a washing machine, right? And... and it, really nice washing machine and a dryer. And I'm after so three excited, weeks, the right? washing machine. So excited working. to do laundry for the first time in your life. <laughs> Sorry. Exactly. <laughs> um, and after three weeks, the washing machine stopped working. And mm -hmm. I'm like, all right, I'm in the boring period. I'm going to call them and say, Hey, it stopped working. And they, uh, they send somebody out and said, yeah, it's the, it's the main board that has to be replaced. And, uh, and then they were like, well, but it's it's on back order. It is only coming in three weeks. I'm like, oh, three weeks without, yeah. you know, you have to you go to the laundromat or whatever, right? It's, it's actually really bad experience. So you can see me connecting with that brand in a right. super negative way. After three weeks, they called and said, sorry, um, it's on back order. will only become available in nine months. And you can just see like, fuses blown right it was like <laughs> yeah how does that no that's not possible i'm in supply chain you have that your order promising i've used that before <laughs> yeah i'm, I'm in like, supply chain i know what happens <laughs> i'm like that can't be right i mean you promised it to me in three weeks and now it's nine months and what happened right mm -hmm. and um so in the end they solved it and then they they got it uh but it, it is um it's not just uh, an operation in the dark that just functions or has to function. It is touching your customers. Mm -hmm. It is touching your suppliers. It is touching your employees. And if you provide for really good technology processes, I think it will make an experience what and how a company is being experienced a whole lot better and different. And you can tell companies that have a tight grip on their supply chain are also regarded as a better brand. So I think that's the opportunity that we have at hand. So one of the disruptions that Amy said that we didn't um, say was network optimization. What do you think about that one as a current disruption? Yeah, I think that a network optimization is uh, another avenue of solution to think about, you know, the, the, the structure of your supply chain. So if I'm a supply chain uh, stakeholder in a company, I, I look at this like, I, like a spider having a web and if there are constantly holes being poked into it, then I'm starting to improve it or build my network 
you know, my spider web somewhere else where there's not constant wind and branches mm -hmm. tearing through it, right? So the network optimization is is one aspect to like, where do I put my warehouses? Which suppliers am I selecting? Which geographies are they sitting? And how can I serve my markets perhaps more locally? Mm. Which is a big trend, uh, I think, for companies that, you know, have their supply chain globally distributed all over the globe. And it takes a long time for transportation processes, which mm -hmm. also, by the way, has a big, you know, footprint on the environment to think about, well, maybe there's a way I can have my manufacturing processes more locally and serve customers more locally, right? Yeah, absolutely. And Audrey asks, I'm going to ask this question now, because I'm wondering if this is an opportunity is now a time for outsour outsourcing or keeping or bringing back in house as far as an opportunity is concerned when we're thinking about some of the disruptions, some of the areas that we may have brought in house, is it worth looking at outsourcing at this point? Yeah. I mean, look at, um, if you look at the Smith curve, do you know Smith curve? I do not explain it's, it. It's a curve that's curved <laughs> like that. The, that what aspect in the company is perceived as the value of your brand. Okay. And at the top, you have like uh, sales and marketing and, mm -hmm. you know, any, anything that kind of is visible on the outside. And then you may have um, de delivery and procurement. And at the very bottom, you know, what is the very bottom is manufacturing and supply chain. Mm. And so this is sort of the old notion that, and that's led to companies just like outsource manufacturing. It's not actually connected to the value of my brand, it, right? And that's why, you know, people outsource logistics and manufacturing and say, no, my, I'm just a brand owner. Right. You have my product design up there, right? How great my product looks like, but not how I'm building it and moving it. Why would that be interesting, right? And I think that changed. I think the curve now is different. I think now it becomes, uh, uh, there's awareness that supply chain is a very valuable function in a company. Awesome. So Emily actually asks, what are some of the ways that SAP software helps with those opportunities? Any SAP S4 HANA examples? Any S4, yeah. So look, I mean, what brought me to SAP is I actually worked outside of SAP in supply chain, you know, in best of breed. And I looked at SAP like, you know, this software looks horrible. It is slow. <laughs> it is rigid. You know, there are all sorts of SAP jokes about, you know, how bad it is. And I was at a conference and I looked at some of the software and I was looking at a demo. I was like, hey, this, this looks really slick. Um, this is actually pretty cool stuff. Right. And, uh, and uh, we just did an announcement to, today that we want to, you know, get into the mid market with S4 HANA, right? Because mm -hmm. there, it, it's the simplicity of of the solution um, that can be adopted now by by, by smaller companies, right? Um, so there are a lot of examples of how we're driving our software strategy. Of of course, in S4 HANA, you have the enterprise core. It's sort of the recording system. Of, of a company. It's sort of the, the socket where a lot of things are coming together, right? And how we extend S4 HANA with really best in class supply chain solutions from a planning perspective, we're looking at like integrated business planning. This solution has been going viral over, over the last few years, really rethinking supply chain from scratch, right? We had yeah. supply chain solutions before, but we're like, okay, we're putting them aside and rethink supply chain from scratch around simulations and scenarios, consuming external data, which will be key in the current discussion around resiliency because a lot of the risks are not cut captured in my ERP. So I need to have that window to the outside world to right. look at risk, at weather, at, you know, traffic at, uh, you know, cost, lead indicators, GDPs, uh, you know, how much does labor cost? Is there a trend I need to look at? Um, so there are phenomenal solutions 
how we take S4HANA as, as sort of the innovation engine for SAP to, to renovate and innovate for the enterprise core, the heartbeat of a company, huh. and surround it with phenomenal solutions that can be integrated into it in the cloud. We lifted all of manufacturing into the cloud with a manufacturing execution system into the cloud wow. uh, and, and really innovated from scratch. So we haven't, that actually brought me to SAP is like, we're not taking the stuff that was groundbreaking in the nineties and just took that and put it into a hosted environment, put a little coat of paint on it and say, now this is the modern stuff. No, we have put a reset button and re-innovated from scratch. Very few companies afford to do that. Yeah. And, and that's what I love about SAP is that innovative thinking, investing into thinking from scratch. Well, and I also think the insights that you're talking about are invaluable, right? We're talking about all these different disruption categories that supply chain professionals literally have to manage. And it's almost like they're juggling a whole bunch of balls in the air, right? And so having a solution or a platform or a software that you're working with that can give you insights in every single one of those and goes, hey, today you need to look over here. Hey, tomorrow you need to look over here or the next day or, or what have you, right? And that is how we move forward as supply chains. That's how we move forward with resiliency in supply chains because disruptions aren't going anywhere. It's how we're going to manage those that are going to make all the difference. Yeah, and I think the, the, the other notion that becomes painfully apparent when you work through a disruption, and I talked to some world leading brands when they were working through a disruption they said we had like war rooms we had people wow. had, that had to go back effectively to just the basics of how can i run mrp faster because right. i cannot make decisions right so what the learning is there too is that horizontal connectivity of solutions right we like the typical old way of thinking is I have like a CRM solution that looks at the customer and then I have mm -hmm. a logistics solution that looks at transportation and warehouse management. And then I have manufacturing. The shop floor system is again completely on the side and planning is somewhere else, right? And yeah. the way they connect is more sort of infrequent finance planning, right? There's a big initiative that we're currently doing at SAP to connect financial planning with supply chain planning. Huge component. Yep. And and I have heard, you know, when I ask companies, how do you how does the finance department work with supply chain? Well, they avoid each other. Um, <laughs> they don't really they like just each walk other. like this past each other's offices. I mean, <laughs> yeah, it's like and uh, right, because the supply chain is like asking for expedited shipment at the end of the quarter and then finance says, I want to get the inventory off the books. I mean, they, right. they constantly have tension. And what companies actually need is a more real time environment to drive the business, mm -hmm. to have finance and supply chain actually go hand in hand. And technology is sort of the marriage counselor sometimes, right? Because <laughs> we now build an environment where they can look at the same dashboard and they have their income statement and projected balance sheet and, you know, cost factors. And they agree that they have the same goal, <laughs> which is growth, margin, customer service. And, and so we're working on this, what we call XPNA extended planning and analysis uh, initiative to put world-class financial planning with supply chain planning actually together. Right. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's the benefit for SAP is we, we're not just like a best of breed with one function. We can actually look at this interoperability between the different disciplines in a company. So for me, that is uh, massively interesting to do. So I'm seeing all the posts and the tweets going out right now. Technology is the new hashtag marriage counselor. So when you do tweet that out, make sure to tag Let's Talk Supply Chain and SAP and especially David. 
<laughs> you have to make sure that he's the one that said that. I'm going to see that all depend. over marketing for technology companies now. Hashtag marriage counselor. Anyways, <laughs> I love that analogy. Thank you, David. But when we're talking about issues like around industry challenges and opportunities and seeing supply chain as that value driver in a business, right? We really can't ignore the sustainability perspective. I talked about this at the beginning with the introduction you know, Forbes summed it up perfectly when they said you can't have a sustainable business without a sustainable supply chain. And it's so true, right? Supply chains have a huge impact on the environment. We have to accept that it's our responsible responsibility to make meaningful change. But it's a difficult task, right? It's another one of those balls that the supply chain professionals are really just trying to manage as well as businesses. So David, what are the challenges of adopting more sustainable practices across supply chains? Yeah, so I think, I mean, this is near and dear to my heart, right? Because I think you know, companies often think of I can do only one, but not both. And and uh, I believe it actually goes absolutely hand in hand. When you think about sustainable, then that means you're saving precious resources. If you're okay. saving precious resources, you ultimately also save cost, right? We had a, a, a one customer um, is is our part to doing building products, and they said, "Look, we want to build the most innovative factory. We want to equip it with the best of SAP software." And on the dashboards all over the factory were, you know, ESG reports, water, energy consumption, scrap, waste. Wow. They made that actually as sort of the purpose. Uh, and they equipped it with like 1600 sensors around the factory to actually, you know, move the needle to understand in real time, how can I, uh, you know, have continuous improvement to, to, to make things better. And it became actually a lighthouse for the company. So a lot of times we, we, we think like, this is hard, this is difficult. A lot of times this is also perhaps laziness, right? Because right. the future for companies, you look today on the, the venture capitalist asset management, like in Europe, 50% of all the asset management is going towards companies that are proven to be sustainable, that can report and track and, and prove that they have a responsible product design, they have a responsible way they're dealing with their suppliers. And, uh, and that uh, uh, the capabilities that businesses need is first of all, actually being able to track it. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, it's, if I ask, you know, business leaders, how much carbon is generated in your supply chain? They, a Don't lot know. of them say, well, we have an initiative on the way right now. <laughs> uh, okay. And, so rather than, I don't know, we have something on the way. Got it. I, I, yes, well, because I think you will, it's, it's essentially focus on that or you'll, you'll basically fossilize. You become the right. new blockbuster that has just completely missed the boat. Mm -hmm. And so tracking uh, your sustainability footprint, your responsible way you design your supply chain, which is also going into, you know, upstream in the supply chain is, is not just your own right? But it is the trading partners that you're dealing with. And are they having any, you know, child labor, uh, you know, um, and that becomes massively important. There's another story from uh, um, a company called Fonterra. They're actually one of the biggest dairy companies in the world in, in, in New Zealand. And, uh, and they had issues in their supply chain because they couldn't really prove that you know, the, the, the product was actually coming from the right sources oh. that, were, that there were no maybe toxic things in there that it was not counterfeiting. And wow. you talk about milk that you put into children's bodies. Right. So you can just see that if there is a lack of trust in your product, it has a massive impact also commercially. Yeah. And uh, so what they actually implemented is an end to end material traceability using our you know global batch traceability and being able to create that full transparency to the consumer and say we know everything where our product was manufactured down you know upstream to 
you know, where the cow was. <laughs> and, uh, and I think that is something that a new generation of consumers will be demanding more and more and more. And so now is the time to invest into, into sustainable uh, business practices, responsible supply chain business practices. And it's our responsibility at SAP, which we're taking very seriously, to also build this into our product as another dimension, just like finance. It is, you know, like carbon footprint tracking, for example, becomes another coin in the equation Yeah, that you can track all the way through long-term planning. We have this, you know, carbon tracking in, in integrated business planning. We have it in product footprint management when you talk about product design, all the way back to all the transactions and your suppliers. And, uh, and I think that is something that we want to bring to the table. We want to enable you, right? We want to be the resource to help companies uh, getting there and modernize and be not the company that is fossilized, but be the company that is succeeding. Yeah, yeah. And there's a lot of opportunities here, right? You've talked about the investment and how we need to have investment to be able to create those sustainable supply chains. One opportunity that comes to my mind is the brand marketing, the story that comes around the fact of like how much you know about your supply chain where the raw materials are coming from, how you're producing the finished product, how it's being moved, right? Maybe the distribution facility that you're using is um, creating energy for that particular city and is doing some great things for people within that community. Mm -hmm. And I think, you know, that to me is, is also a really big opportunity for companies that are maybe not making the most out of it, but could be, what are some of the other opportunities of having a sustainable supply chain that businesses and organizations should be considering and thinking about when they're thinking about this investment? Yeah, I think the other aspect is um, if you think about the entire life cycle, right, of a product, then of course you have how it was made and where the raw material was sourced and, how much plastic is in there, right? I mean, this this is, you know, in the DNA of our software now that we have, you know, as part of responsible design, you can actually tell how much of the stuff that is in your product is actually recyclable, um, right? And then now sure. we're getting into actually the extension of the life cycle, returnable products, recyclable uh, products, right? Yeah. Um, and th there is another story and very, very evident why that is actually connected to your commercial success. So I'm, I'm in California, nine hours away from Germany. I have to get up very early in the morning, typically for meetings, sometimes 5 a.m., 6 a.m. And the one thing that I have no patience with is spending a lot of time creating a coffee. Right. So I have an espresso machine where I can just get up and I press the button and I can have a coffee and I have like 30 seconds patience. Right. To to do that. So do I love have, it. Do you have the frother? And we have a frother as well. I'm not All a right. big milk fan, but my that's what my <laughs> wife and, and children do. But back in the day, you know, my 14 year old daughter back in the day said, well, but that's not a very responsible thing to do because right. you have these aluminum capsules right yep. and that's not right you need to do ground coffee and then you need to put it on the compost right so that is the age of children where they give you the mm -hmm. you know they're they're like the the sustainability agent now in the family yeah and i was ha very happy to find that nespresso has a recycling program they do i use it all the time right and you can just get a bag and that's where you collect all the capsules and then you send it back and then they recycle it and and they create new capsules so i was super happy to find because now i can keep the nespresso machine and right everybody's and happy everybody's happy <laughs> and uh and, and and i think that's another angle where companies start to think beyond just the consumption right but what happens afterwards how can i reclaim uh you know important resources um there are startups that think about not like put, just taking away the cars off the street and trashing them but how can we reclaim stuff yeah um and i, I think mean, if that's... you think about sorry if you think about amsterdam alone i think there is like 
a mountain of bicycles at the bottom of their um, their ravine system mm -hmm. that could be used, reused, and recycled, and things like that. I mean, there's all sorts of ways and all sorts of things that we we can we can be doing more. A absolutely, and I think some of this is 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 again, I I think facilitated by the new generations that will be more open, right? I mean, shampoo is another example. Shampoo bottle is like 99% water, okay? And now you put that on a truck. So the truck, all it transports is water. And when you're standing in the shower, there is water. So, right? So there are companies like, I think Procter & Gamble was, was saying, hey, how about we just have a capsule that is the shampoo, right? And the capsule dispenser yep. in your shower. And, and now you could have the equivalent of a pallet of shampoo bottles now actually has no weight at all. And it can be transported much more easily. It, it, it mm -hmm. doesn't consume that much fuel to be transported. So I think there are all sorts of innovative ideas uh, to, to rethink uh, essentially business models, to rethink product design. Yeah. And what we want to do from SAP is provide the technology to make that easier for businesses, right? Yeah. To pivot the product design, to pivot essentially your manufacturing and logistics processes towards more sustainable operations. Yeah, because it's it's a very heavy lift, right? You need the right partners. You need the right technology to be able to help you do it. And you don't want it to take a massively long time either, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, in this day and age, things can't be taking years and years and years to be able to do. We need to be doing some of that, especially when it comes to climate change and sustainability. We need to be doing some of those things today. Now, I want to get back to talking about resiliency, um, because that really is how we're going to get through disruption. And I think, you know, some of the things that we need to think about is technology, which we'll get to in a minute, but we also need to think about leadership skills. Mm -hmm. What do our supply chain leaders need to really have as a vision? Or what are some of the skills that today's leaders really need to have to create that resiliency to drive their teams and their supply chains through disruption? Yeah, and I think it is, you know, I think the supply chain leaders of the future need to be a lot more, uh, you know, storytelling. The, they now have the ear of the board in a negative way. <laughs> I mean, it was like last year, like, you know, 350 CEOs of the Fortune 500 companies mentioned the word supply chain in their earnings call, right? So right. supply chain is now, okay, they have the awareness. I think the leadership skills goes really down to, um, I think there was this wonderful book. You had, you know, Knut Alike and, and Radu on your show that wrote the book Source to Sold, right? And uh, um, where they interviewed supply chain leaders and what are the character traits that we need in the future. And they came up with this chain model, right? Which I think was, no, I, I hope I'm not messing it up, is, mm -hmm. is, you know, collaborative, holistic, adaptable. And the N was actually... Um, uh, being narrative and improving essentially the way we are articulating the value of supply chain mm. to get the necessary investments, right? And how often a supply chain leader perhaps goes to the CEO and CFO and say, you know, we need to implement the ABC segmentation in our ATP to APS I API for the ADI, EDI 850 and <laughs> To improve our OTD. Acronyms. <laughs> and uh, supply chain is probably the biggest vertical in a company that is so proud of their three-letter acronyms. Yes. And and they form this sort of inner circle of, you know, you know what I'm talking about? So what I just said for supply chain people will be, a, yeah, I know what you're talking about, right? Mm -hmm. But we need to be able to tell it in plain English, right? So what I just said needs to be like, we, rec we need to recognize the important of our customers to promise orders to take care of the most important customers, right? And making mm -hmm. sure that they are being, you know, uh, they are staying loyal to us. And that is something that now the CEO understands. And, uh, and now they will be more open to actually, uh, you know, create innovation on that front with technology, with people, 
uh, with the right amount of practices. It does cost money. It does cost time. Just like really good firefighting <laughs> is not something that is coming for free. Right. However, that investment is protecting, right? Your brand, protecting your uh, customers, your consumers. Uh, and again, you cannot underestimate the danger. If you have a story coming out, you're a food company and there was a big quality issue and you're poisoning people, you, you can be going out of business very quickly. Yeah. Right? So, yeah. No, I like that you're talking about storytelling. I mean, obviously in my business, storytelling is, is a really big part. And when we talk about doing a live like this or a live show, I always encourage talking about analogies, bringing stories to the forefront, because that's how we learn. That's how we learn. That's how we grow. That's how we resonate with what it is that we need to do or we need to be thinking about or maybe thinking about something in a different light. And storytelling mm -hmm. can really help with that, right? Because you, like you said, us as supply chain professionals, we get into the analogies or not the analogies, sorry, the acronyms. And um, we need you know, to we get into the analogies instead of the, uh, the acronyms, analogies. right? So <laughs> but we get into these acronyms and we think that everybody knows what we're talking about and they understand what it actually means to have a resilient supply chain or how we're thinking about supply chains. And we're thinking about that end user customer, right? We're thinking about the suppliers as a customer as well. We're thinking about everything that happens in between for the best of the business, right? But a lot of times yeah. they look at supply chain as a cost center. And yeah. we're starting to change that. And I think storytelling will help us with that. Absolutely. And, and and supply chain can be a huge catalyst to also, you know, thinking about changing business models, right? More and more companies are maybe going away from just selling a product, but they're selling more a service, right? It's sort of the outcome based uh, economy where I'm not interested to, to perhaps buy a, a television, I just want to watch TV. Well, maybe in the future, there will be that you just basically lease it or rent it. And right you automatically get upgraded every two years, right? So I think- Like the Rivian. Like the what? The Rivian. I was in the Rivian, the oh, all yeah. electric SUV. I was in one a couple of weeks ago. And they were telling me that it was like getting a brand new car every day <laughs> because they kept updating the system every day. Yeah. I mean, look, I think, and that's where supply chain can be a, a, a facilitator. I think there are- good example companies where the CEO actually came out of supply chain and understands yeah. the, the value of supply chain. Tim Cook is, is a good example, right? Yeah. Um, of, of how Apple actually designed their supply chain and, and is having a tight grip on quality and, you know, all the way uh, multiple tiers up actually in the supply chain. And, and that helps them to actually innovate uh, pretty fast and, and, and be successful. Right. And, yeah. and, and, and it's for me still amazing, right? That uh, that when the new iPhone launches, all the sudden millions of phones overnight, you can order online. I mean, if I would be this order management system, uh, I would be very challenged to eat millions of orders and being able to serve them, right? Um, so it's another example where technology is a, it's a big resource and facilitators. Uh, for companies to have that innovation motor and and providing the great service. Well, I'm glad you said that. Ergen says, if your market share is increasing, even if it's not permanent in an environment of uncertainty, you are doing something different and beautiful than your competitors. And there's always a well-designed software behind the success. So let's talk about technology and <laughs> resiliency. Now, just for everybody's information, we've got about 10 minutes left. And so if you have any more questions for David, we want to make sure that we get to those. So put those in the comments. But let's talk about about technology, right? We've been talking about data for a really long time. I think something else that's really been coming on to the market as a hot topic is machine learning and artificial intelligence. So talk to us about technology and how it plays that role. Talk yeah. to us about how the importance of data and also the emergence of the machine learning and the AI and, and how that's going to rock the future of our supply chains that are going to be resilient. Yeah, uh, so it's it's super interesting. I think AI and and it got a new renaissance, right, with ChatGPT, where now all of a sudden was like, it, it, there was maybe perhaps a little bit of a sobering moment. People were tired yeah. to talk about AI, and it was like, yeah, is this really, 
you know, there was a study where in supply chain, you know, businesses said I, only 20% actually got a return on their AI and machine learning initiatives. And, and, um, but I think there is a, a, there is a recognition of, the vast amount of data that is required to be more resilient. So for us, actually at SAP, it's, it's two dimensions that we're innovating. One is of course on the AI and machine learning side, doing pattern recognition. Uh, for example, in the shop floor, you can do quality inspections using cameras, uh, automatically detecting any kind of deviation and it learns, right? It learns, all right, that was actually a bad product. That is a good product. Right. So it learns from it, right? So we all know that machine learning can help with pictures and the TikToks has interesting picture filters. So everybody knows <laughs> there is something there. Guess what? You can actually use this in supply chain a lot, right? Tracking stuff through the warehouse and, and just using imaginary uh, to actually uh, learn essentially and create uh, that material flow. The other aspect, of course, is, is in planning. We've been using uh, machine learning uh, and AI capabilities in integrated business planning for a very long time to better forecast, to learn essentially from different lead indicators, to understand how does pricing influence the volume? How does um, you know outside indicators influence um, your product sales? And sometimes it's... It's uh, the data that is actually needed to feed that monster. If you think AI just being that very hungry monster, some companies say, I don't have enough data to give it to. Right. And all, the value only comes into play if you have a lot of data where you can do what machine learning does great, which is pattern recognition. So an example is... Um, like Microsoft, uh, you know, they're they're using our software for 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 planning for their devices, et cetera, and in their for their cloud data centers, they experimented to just put all sorts of lead indicators, weather, traffic, against the consumption in their Azure cloud to see what correlates without having a hypothesis of what it is, and they found a strong correlation with weather, and then they were like weather why is weather a correlated factor in the Azure consumption? And they double clicked and found it's the Xbox gaming that rises up when the weather is bad. Huh. So you think like, oh yeah, oh, oh of course, right? So now you can actually yeah. use weather in the future to balance your... But now uh, learning that they can use this abundance of data to feed the AI monsters that we've created and actually create really interesting business insights that actually, you know, gives them a head on, you know, their margin, maybe avoids inventory that you put out there right. by understanding consumer behavior in a better and makes you more sustainable, right? Yep. So I think this is where technology can be a massive help and we're doing massive investments on the data front, right? So we have a partnership with Everstream, for example. They look at risk data, sitting on a big logistics network data and understanding, you know, if there is bad weather on a, you know, transportation lane, they understand risk that surrounds your suppliers. Now bringing that data in is going to be your smoke detector. <laughs> Going yeah. back to the fire analogy, right? <laughs> Bring uh, it back full circle, David. Well, and the, the other one is, is a partnership we have with Cosmotech. Very, very interesting uh, what we're doing on that front, which is actually a vulnerability analysis. So we all know that risks are existing. There will be disruptions again this year and next year, but we don't know what they are. Right. But what I can do is understand where are the weak spots in my supply chain? Like if this factory goes down, 90% of my revenue will go down. Right. That's actually really good to understand. So it's just like understanding the weak spots in your house relative. This is when the fire marshal comes in in a movie theater and says, that curtain is bad. This is bad. Right. And, and you know, 
this is what they provide with a massive amount of really intelligent analysis where you can bring in your supply chain data and it tells you this component from this supplier, this transportation lane, this region is going to be very much a risk area. If something happens there, this is the business impact that you will see. Absolutely. All right. With six, well, about five minutes left, what are you excited about for the future? What's SAP excited about? What what can we see coming down the line from SAP? So I think what we are really focusing on is having the best capabilities for, you know, the different functions in a supply chain, the best supply chain planning solution, the best warehouse management solution where we connect to robotics. We're bringing the latest innovations also through massive partnerships. I think that's worth mentioning. Um, it's not just us. Collaboration is the future of business. Collaboration is the future of business. And that yep. means also collaborating with partners. They can sometimes run a lot faster on innovation than we can. Uh, well, but we have a lot of the you know, massive enterprises and we have yeah. sort of the socket and the backbone to plug into. And so we're super open to work with partners on awesome. providing and bringing innovations to the customer. And the other angle that we're really focusing, focusing on is that horizontal connection. We call this the supply chain from design to operate, designing a product, manufacturing a product, the logistics, delivery, inbound logistics, planning, and then also operating all the assets uh, and the service that goes with it, right? And there is such a massive amount of opportunity if you connect these that it will just accelerate the way a company can actually innovate, yeah. you know, prevent s disruptions from causing an impact to the business. You cannot prevent the disruption of self. If the Suez Canal is being blocked, then then you have to just deal with it, right? So yeah. I think that's going to be uh, um, uh, our big focus and making our customers successful in their journey and listening to them and partnering with them. Uh, and uh, I think you can tell by the technology we're providing today, we've done actually a pretty good job listening to customers and what they yeah. need. Yeah. Um, so that's, I think, going to be Great. a big... Uh, focus for us. Great. So what's one thing that everybody should walk away from this discussion, maybe thinking about or putting into action? I think I encourage everyone to give SAP a fresh look. If I talk to people that have been, oh, I've worked with SAP back in the nineties and, you know, and I even know a little bit of ABAP uh, and, but they don't, they haven't given it a fresh look. What is the latest capabilities that we've built natively in the cloud with phenomenal user experience, right? To, yeah. to go away from your belief of what SAP is into I'm going in with a completely fresh mind like there is a completely new SAP and where we have the experience bundled with modern innovative technology and the 50-year experience that we have that we just celebrated that birthday Congratulations. Matters. Matters. We've gone through years and years of changes and business changes and disruptions. And all of that learning is also embedded in the software, right? So I think that's where companies maybe should give it a chance to say, let me give a fresh look. Great. Go in with fresh eyes. Well, as we head quickly into Q2, it's clear that some key supply chain trends have taken center stage for 2023. Risk resiliency is top of mind. Sustainability is vital. And as I've been saying for a long time now, collaboration is the key to all of it. Internally, teams need to work together towards that shared goal. But perhaps more importantly, organizations need to build partnerships that drive change. Neither resilience or sustainability sustainability are things we can achieve alone and leveraging the power of strategic partners like SAP can drive innovation, create sustainable initiatives and help build resilient supply chains now and in the future. Thank you so much, David, for that session. I really enjoyed it. I mean, you shared 
so much insight and it's certainly given me a lot to think about. And a big thank you to everyone who joined us today. Whether you're watching or listening, do go and check out sap.com forward slash programs forward slash sustainable dash supply dash chain. For more information, that's going to be in the comments for you. There are a lot of reports and resources there to help. And you can also find out more about how to manage business risk holistically with SAP Solutions. David, thank you again for joining me today. Thank you. And, and we'll see everybody soon. Thanks, David. Bye-bye.